while he was here, he heard them sing, and he was like, you know what? I need to get your praise team in front of the whole state. And so we're, we're going to share our skills and abilities. So put your hands together. Praise God for these. Would you take the word of God, hold the scriptures close to your heart. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity to hear your word. Help me pay attention. I pray, God, that I would hear this, apply it to my life, and be changed by it. Let there be no difference in what you say and what I hear. In Jesus' name, would you stretch your hands toward me, Heavenly Father. Let your grace and glory shine on me. Let your power be revealed in me. I worship you. I magnify you. I exalt you, O oh God. Anoint me tonight to preach. Cleanse my heart. Purify my mind. May there be no sin or barrier of lack of faith that would keep me from being able to speak your word with authority. Please, God, create in me a clean heart and make me a clear conduit of your word tonight. In Jesus' name. Please remain standing. 1 Samuel chapter 17, starting with verse 4. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was about 10 feet tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head. He was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was about 200 pounds. And he had bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels. I think that's somewhere around 30 pounds. That's where he could, he could throw a spear away. You couldn't even bowl with a bowling ball weighing 30 pounds. And a shield bearer went before him. So the shield bearer had to carry all that stuff. Then he stood up and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And you, the servants of Saul, choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. Say amen at the reading of God's word. You may be seated. This sets off the great debate we're going to discuss tonight. Where did these giants come from and where did they go? There is a lot of interesting theories on this passage of scripture. And we're going to talk about those giants. For a few moments, I want to bore you <laughs> with a discussion that has intrigued me since we discussed Balaam. There are three people here tonight that will be very interested in what I'm about to say. And I, I want to go ahead and give them the opportunity to enjoy my advance of this discussion of Balaam and my theory on the order of Melchizedek. Now, I recognize this has nothing to do with giants. I've just been geeking out about it since we talked about it. And I'm probably going to add a little bit on the order of Melchizedek all along the way. The good news about being the pastor is that you can just say whatever you want to talk about when you get up here. And I want to talk about this for a few moments, if you don't mind. Paul used that phrase, order of Melchizedek. This was a derivative of Psalm 110, where David used the phrase, order of Melchizedek. Genesis 14 is the story of Melchizedek. This is an unusual story because Abraham, the patriarch of the family of God, meets Melchizedek and gives him a tithe of his possessions and is blessed by Melchizedek. Paul gives us the inference that the lesser is always blessed by the greater. And so Melchizedek, the priest of God, who was not of the family of Abraham, was the greater and Abraham the lesser. Paul says that Jesus was of the order of Melchizedek. We have always interpreted that loosely. I recognize that may not be a problem for most because they're accustomed to the idea of reading the Bible and just kind of throwing away things that don't make sense. But I don't think that you can just set aside that phrase, order of Melchizedek, and infer that it's completely metaphorical. That we're just taking Melchizedek and saying Jesus is a lot like that. I think that there's something to the order of Melchizedek. Matter of fact, there are ancient writings that seem to infer that the Jews had some affinity for this idea that there was an ancient order outside the family of God that seemed to have some superpowers, if you will, as it relates to conversing with God. 
They did not make it part of their doctrine, but it became part of their fireside conversation. So I believe that Paul perhaps was preying upon this particular vantage point, this fable labeled by some and fact by others, and he was simply drawing upon what they had always believed to be true and saying Jesus was connected to the order of Melchizedek. I made the bold conclusion or bold statement, not necessarily conclusion, this theory that just maybe this order of Melchizedek was an actual order of priests. I'm not the only one to ever theorize about this. There is quite a bit of literature written on the idea of there being an order of Melchizedek. And that Jethro, the father-in-law of Moses, seemed to fall in line with this ancient order. When Moses came out of Egypt and they went into the wilderness, Moses did not offer the first sacrifice in the wilderness. Jethro did. Jethro was not Hebrew. He was the priest of Midian, a Midianite. And he offered the sacrifice and he blessed Moses. So that once again we learn that the lesser is blessed by the greater. Jethro instructed Moses. We also know that the son of Jethro went with Moses into the promised land. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. And I draw a line all the way to the gold, frankincense, and myrrh that was indicative of the land of the Midianites. And I am wondering if the three wise men were not a continuation of the order of Melchizedek. So that when Jesus was born, they came to worship him. And they didn't have the family of God. They were serving God based upon information they were receiving in a way that's very unusual to us. Now, I add one caveat to this because I've been studying the layout of Israel, and I want to I want to give you one interesting story, and then we'll move to the giants. <laughs> I hope you're interested in this. I I love this sort of thing. But do you remember when the Philistines stole the Ark of the Covenant? Have you read that story? And they named that child Ichabod. Now, when they brought the Ark of the Covenant into the camp of the Philistines, terrible things happened. Dagon was destroyed and the people became very sick. And the Philistines said, we need to get rid of this thing before we all die. So they offered a sacrifice to God and put this thing on a cart and put oxen carrying or or pulling this cart. And these, I think it was cattle, and they were pulling this cart. And they went into the land of Israel and the Philistines watched it. And there's a town, Beth Shemesh, I can't remember exactly how to say it but the people of Israel in that little town they got the cart and started to sacrifice to God and glorify God and when the Philistines saw that the ark of the covenant went back to the Hebrews they rejoiced went back to their town and realized they were going to live to see another day well in Beth Shemesh they looked in the ark After they committed those sacrifices, they pulled the lid off the ark. And somewhere around 50 to 70,000 people died. They did something interesting. I'll give you the verses later, but I, I hope you go home and look this up. I hope I've intrigued you enough to go find out what I'm talking about. But the Beth Shemesh crowd when they had all of this disaster and and these thousands of people died, they sent word to a little town called Kiriath-Jerim. And they said to the people of Kiriath-Jerim, come get the Ark of the Covenant. And the Bible says they came and got it from that little town, Kiriath-Jerim, took it back to the house of Abinadab, and he kept it in his house for 20 years. There was something about Kiriath-Jerim that made them realize that they could call on them and they would know what to do. 
And if you study the genealogy of Kiriath-Jerim, those were the Kenites. They were the descendants of Jethro. There was a sub-tribe, gets worse. There was a sub-tribe of the Kenites called the Rechabites. Briefly mentioned in the book of Jeremiah. It was an unusual story because the Hebrews were about to be banished to Babylon. And the whole nation was going to be enslaved. And God told Jeremiah, call in the Rechabites and offer them wine. So he prepared the wine and brought in the Rechabites and said, drink. And they said, no, we don't drink. Our great-grandfather told us not to drink. And we're not touching the stuff. And the Spirit of God came on Jeremiah and said, Because you have honored your fathers, and because you have kept your integrity, you will be the only people left in the land of Israel, and you will be the caretakers of this great land. So when all of Israel had to leave, the descendants of Jethro were still there in the promised land. It seems to me that throughout Scripture, every time the Hebrews rejected God, sinned against God, or didn't understand God, someone from the order of Melchizedek stepped in and led them to the right sacrifice and the right way and the right worship. So that when the Jews rejected Jesus, Jesus became a priest, not of the Levitical order, but of the order of Melchizedek. The greater began to bless the lesser, and Jesus is the great high priest in heaven of the order of Melchizedek. Anyway. And so I, I will probably give you all the scripts. I may type this up. Um, I have it all here. I could start just rolling out the, the names and numbers and we'll make those available to you. But I, I just think it's interesting. Now listen to me. Pastor, are you 100% sure on that? No. Absolutely not. We have had thousands of years to discuss these things. I am simply giving you my perspective on what is a mystery in the Bible. And I'm telling you, listen to me. The Bible is full of wonderful explorations. Well, pastor, what if you're wrong about it? Well, if you're wrong, the ground opens up and you go straight to hell. Listen, God gave us this wonderful book to study for the rest of our lives. And even when, how many of you thought you knew something... And then years later, God adds to it, and you're like, wow, I never saw that. And if you'll let me intrigue your curiosity, even if you disagree with my order of Melchizedek, and you say, you know what, I have a different thought on it. It's all right. Study the Word of God, and sometimes the mysteries of God will lead you to greater knowledge than simply studying the facts that are easy to read and understand. So, let's talk about these giants. Goliath, technically, if you wanted to get specific, he's probably 9 feet 9 inches tall. So not quite 10 feet. And he has this incredible challenge to the people of God. And we see this great story of David versus Goliath. Now, he's not the greatest of the giants. He's only the most famous. In the Bible, they were called Nephilim, Anakim, after the descendants of Anak. I'm confident I'm not pronouncing any of this correctly, but you have no idea how to say it, so. There is another name called Emim, if you're trying to look up Hebrew words. And then there's a controversial word that I happen to believe should be translated always Raphaim. The valley of Raphaim, the land of giants. But they, they 
translate that word differently from time to time because the word Raphaim eventually became somewhat of a curse so that it became synonymous with the word death. And I'll talk more about that in just a few moments. But there's four different names and these seem to indicate four different races or families of giants all of which were defeated by Israel. Let me deal with the end of the giants as best I can. It seems to me that the end of the giants, as it were, as a people populating the earth, was eradicated by the anointing and authority of King David. Um, I don't want to overspeak on that. There are lots of disagreements. Some believe that there was some level of interaction until the time of Christ. And then ultimately those things that would create giants were held in chains of darkness, etc., etc. Um, I don't have a lot to go by on that. All I can tell you is after King David, there's no mention of giants in the Bible. It seems to be that he, he pretty well took care of that problem. Um, and it seems to be that God always wanted to use his people to defeat this unholy race. Um, that there was something profane about them. And so the giants were destroyed by the people of God. Uh, in Genesis chapter 6, it says there was giants on the earth in those days and also afterward. Speaking of before the flood and after the flood. We'll go back to that verse by the end of the discussion here of our history of giants. Numbers chapter 13, it says, And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land though which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw were of great stature. There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak, came from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were also in their sight. Deuteronomy 2 verse 10, there's where we get the two names. The Emim had dwelt there in times past, a people as great and numerous and as tall as the Anakim. And so you have two races of giants that lived in two separate locations. I would say the reigning champ of the big guys, the largest guy in the Bible, was probably Og, who was the king of Bashan. Um, he remained of the remnant of the giants. They defeated him on the wilderness side of the Jordan River. Uh, we don't really know how tall he was in terms of measuring him, but his bed that he slept on was 13 feet long. It's a big old boy. <laughs> now, Goliath's family, this seems to be the remnant finally taken care of. It's, it's a, a powerful few verses in 2 Samuel chapter 21. If you don't mind, I'll read all seven of these verses. When the Philistines were at war again with Israel, David and his servants went with him, went down and fought against the Philistines, and David grew faint. Then the Ishbanab, who was one of the sons of the giants, the weight of whose bronze spear was 300 shekels, who was bearing a new sword, thought he could kill David. But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, came to his aid and struck the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David swore to him, saying, You shall not go out with us into battle, lest you quench the lamp of Israel. And it happened afterward that there was again a battle with the Philistines at Gob. Then uh, someone, I'm not even going to try and say their name because it's so close to profanity, I don't want to mess up. There's a lot of words in the Bible that if you try and read them with a southern accent, it may very well get you in some serious trouble. So we're going to steer clear of that. He was one of the sons of the giant. And again, there was war at another town with someone else with an appropriate name. The brother of Goliath, the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. Yet again, there was a war at Gath. And there was a man of great stature who had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each feet, each foot. <laughs> 24 in number and he also was born up to the giant so when he divided Israel Jonathan David's brother the son of David's brother killed him wow I didn't know that he had a brother's son who was a warrior like that these four were born to the giants in Gath and fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants and here you see kind of the end of the mention of giants in scripture all right there are four prevailing theories on where these giants came from. And I am going, I have decided, I guess, that I'm just going to tell you what I think. I started Sunday, I might as well stay with it. 
There are four prevailing theories on where the giants came from. The most common that you will hear is this is an exaggerated translation of an ancient word. I would say most seminaries are teaching that our translation of the dimensions of these giants is grossly exaggerated. They also say that the numbers that we use for the people of God and their enemies is also exaggerated. That there weren't quite that many warriors in the army and there weren't that many enemies opposing them. And so this is an exaggeration of an ancient text. The next prevailing theory is that this was a tall race of people that was somewhat reasonable in their height. They just happened to be Scandinavian in their height and the people of God were short in stature. So when you have a whole race of people that are five foot nothing and you have a whole bunch of other people that are six foot something, they're just calling them giants. And it wasn't really that they were giants, it was that they themselves were actually small. Then there are those who get a little more outlandish. I don't have a lot to go by scripturally on this. There's not a ton of veracity, but there are those who believe this is an ancient prehistoric human, that giants are part of our personal um, evolution, and that giants were somewhat indicative all over the world at that time, and you will see little things on YouTube going along with that, and I, it's just a theory, and there you go. There, that, there was an ancient human, and this was a remnant of a prehistoric mankind, and this was the remnant of them, and, and through racism and hatred, these people were destroyed by the modern version of humanity. And then there is the completely crazy Pentecostal theory that the sons of God looked on the daughters of men and had children <laughs> and, and produced giants. And so these are the four theories and I obviously need to remind you of how I read the Bible. I do not believe that we have an inaccurate Bible. You will never get me to the place where I say this is unreliable. I'm not going to hold up the Word of God and say it's a poor translation. I'm never going to say we made a mistake. I'm not going to contend that some of the Bible is written in such a way that um, you can take some of it out and not participate with it anymore because it wasn't meant for history, uh, history or, or reliable manuscript. I, I believe the whole word rightly divided. I believe what you hold in your hand is reliable. I believe it is a translation, but I believe it is a miraculously preserved translation of the power of God manifest in a written form, and I believe the scriptures are reliable, and I don't think any of it is a lie or a throwaway line. The word of God is from everlasting to everlasting. Not one word will pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away. God's word will not pass away. Can I get a witness from somebody? That's not just a testament of the writing of Scripture. It's a testament of the preservation of Scripture. We not only believe that God wrote it, we believe that heaven and earth will pass away, but this word will not pass away. We believe God wrote it and he preserved it. Now, language by definition can be unreliable. There are some languages that are super difficult to name specific instances of, of measurements and that sort of thing. And I'm not trying to preach the total merit of every language on earth. There are languages that you need to use to rightly divide the words, specifically Greek and Hebrew. 
And we have to rely on scholars and our own intellect and our own resources to get to the accurate meaning because those languages were the languages God chose to use when he wrote the word. And so it is very appropriate for you to study Hebrew and or Greek so that you can dig into the word of God and see how it was specifically written when it was given to humanity. English, by definition, is not the language that God used to write Scripture. It's a good language. It has lots of great words in it. And we believe that you can translate accurately from Greek and Hebrew into English as long as you remain a student of the Word and remain humble as you translate. So the English Bible that you have in your hand, according to the way I believe here at Buford Church of God, is reliable for you to read and know what God's Word is when He gave us the Holy Scriptures. Can I get a witness tonight? His word will be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And so I believe that God gave us this wonderful Bible and I believe it's reliable. So you're not going to get me to the place where I think somebody exaggerated. Because if that be the case, the Bible's not half as fun to read. Right? Noah's Ark can't be a metaphor. Has to be cool that all the animals got on the ark. That the the Red Sea. They didn't go through the deep parts. They only waded through the ankle deep parts and, and the marshlands. And I'm like, wait a minute. I believe he parted the water on this side and that and they walked across on dry ground. I believe Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego got down in the lion's den. I, not the lion's den, but the fiery furnace. Daniel went down into the lion's den. I believe the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. I believe every one of these outlandish stories. And I believe that a 10-foot tall giant stood on the middle of that battlefield and hurled insults at the people of God until a little shepherd boy walked there out there with a pocket full of rocks and knocked his head off. I believe it with all of my heart. was a giant I believe that this is described best in the book of Genesis I think that God gave us a very specific scripture so that we could understand where giants came from Genesis chapter 6 verse 4 there were giants on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. I believe that the sons of God looked on the daughters of men and they had children that became giants. Now there's a great debate on who the sons of God were. I believe this phrase is mentioned several times in the Old Testament and always means the same thing. More specifically, in Job chapter 1, verses 6 through 7, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. So I believe the sons of God in the Old Testament were angels. And I believe that part of the sin of the fallen angels was this sin in Genesis chapter 6, verse 4, where the angels of God looked on the daughters of men and had relations with them, and they had children. I believe this is exactly what Jude meant in verses 6 through 7 of his book. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. As Sodom and Gomorrah, which was a sexual sin in Sodom and Gomorrah, and the cities around them in a similar manner. Remember, in Sodom and Gomorrah, it was the men of the city that wanted to sleep with the angels. Having given themselves over to sexual immorality, speaking of angels, and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Pastor, that sounds crazy. It's in the Bible. It's one of the most outlandish mysteries of the Bible. But the Bible says these angels left their estate, their abode. Well, Pastor, I believe this was simply the sons of God, meaning the sons of Seth. 
Seth was 235 years old before he had a son, and his children didn't have children until they were already 235. And the Bible says that when men began to multiply on the earth, Seth and his children did not have enough time to produce this. Not since they waited so late to get started. They were late bloomers. Furthermore, Genesis said that each creature would have children after its kind. Humans do not give birth to non-humans any more than we evolved from a monkey. If you start believing in some sort of birth deformation that alters the race of humanity, then you have to reverse that and say that evolution is somehow what produced us. We believe that in the beginning God created all the creatures that we see according to their kind. And when they reproduce, they reproduce according to their kind. Isaiah said that the Raphaim, the giants, would not be resurrected. They would not be raised from the dead. Which lets me know they weren't human. There was something not soulish about them. And so I believe that the sons of God were fallen angels looking on the daughters of men and they had children. And I believe in a lot of ways that's where, uh, okay, here's my theory. This is a terrible theory. If you don't like it, please remember it's just a theory and I'm not trying to be offensive. But I think this is the, uh, where Greek mythology comes from. I think Greek mythology is a perversion of what the Bible tries to tell you here. That there were at times in the history of humanity people that had these crazy looks and crazy strengths and they were not holy, it was profane, and God got rid of it. And it is that sin which caused the flood of Noah. <laughs> yeah, am, I, am I getting too out there? All right, please forgive me because it's, it's about to get a little bit worse before it gets better. The Bible says that Noah was perfect in his generation. Perfect. What that means is up for debate. Some have said that just means he was righteous. No, there's none righteous. No, not. There's no way he was perfect. What it meant was he was perfect in his genealogy. It wasn't that he was perfect in his generation. It means that he was preserved from this perversion that was producing this false humanity. And that Noah was chosen because he was a pure line from Adam. And God was preserving humanity. You know, maybe I shouldn't have told you this was my theory. You're all looking at me like I'm crazy. It's in the Bible. And there's no way to read it without trying to figure out something about what it means. But I believe that Noah was perfect in his genealogy. And God did not want this inner breeding. But the, the Bible says, my spirit will not always strive with man. In other words, I'm not going to allow this to continue. I'm not going to allow the spirit of my creation to cohabitate with mankind there is some insinuation that the antichrist will actually be a resurgence of this sin another talk for another day but that he may actually be a literal son of the devil I don't know how I feel about that I don't have a theory on it but it is a prevailing theory and so the sons of God looked on the daughters of men they had children both then and afterward and ultimately with David and the authority of a king, everybody say king, the giants were eliminated. So what do we do with this? What, is, what does it matter about giants? I'll tell you several things that it matters to me. It matters to me that for thousands of years, A race of giants had intimidated the people of God. 
these demon-possessed hybrids, these manufactured clones, these transgendered, mutilated bodies of, of demonic influence had somehow invaded so many places on earth that the people of God themselves would often grow intimidated and ashamed, afraid, would run away from them. They had enclaves and kingdoms. There's some inference that the ancient kingdoms could have been built by this race of people, that some of the great manufacturing or production that you see in the, in the ancient world, we keep going, how did they do this? How did they get this rock on top of this hill? How did the pyramids get formed? I think if you insert some of what I'm talking about into the historical timeline of humanity, everything starts to make a little bit more sense. There was a day that the fallen angels interacted with humanity in an unholy way and it created a technology and a race of people that seemed to transcend anything we can comprehend by simply reading the verses of scripture or looking around in cultures today. And for thousands of years this went on until someone from that ancestry stood out and intimidated for I think 30 days he stood out there on the battlefield and terrified everybody that was out there they were all running away from him but one chapter before God had sent the anointing on a little shepherd boy and the anointing of God resting on that little shepherd boy came out onto that battlefield and said I don't care who your mama is I don't care who your daddy is I don't care where you came from I don't care how you got here all I can tell you is I don't come to you with sword and spear, but in the name of the Lord God of Israel, I'm not ashamed, I'm not intimidated. I will defy you and I will feed you to the birds of the air on this day. That should be encouraging to you that it is the anointing of God that breaks the yoke. There's no weapon formed against us will prosper. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. We're not born of this world. We don't have to worry about what the giants are or where they came from. What I know is my Redeemer lives and no matter what the enemy comes in with like a flood, the Spirit of God can raise up a standard against him. The greatest warriors perhaps in biblical history represented by one giant standing out on the battlefield and a little shepherd boy picked up a rock and threw it at him. Does that not help you? I know we face things in this world but it's nothing like what Jesus overcame 2,000 years ago. And when you have the anointing of a king well pastor I'm not a king. Not true. The Bible says in Revelation that we have been made to be both kings and what? Priests of what order? We've been made to be both kings like David and priests like Melchizedek. We have the anointing of God on our lives. If you read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, you'll realize that when you ask Jesus into your heart, you get superpowers that stretch from here to Golgotha. There is a bloodline of power that comes into your life and your name is written down in the Lamb's book of life and the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead moves into your heart and you can walk out onto the battlefield and face the giants that are in your life and say my know that my redeemer lives somebody give God praise give God praise give God praise hallelujah hallelujah <laughs> glory to God glory to God Can y'all see him now, little old shepherd boy? Let no man lose heart on the account of this Philistine. Your servant will go kill him. Boy, how you think you're going to beat him? You but a boy and him a warrior from his youth. Ten foot tall, you five foot nothing. They won't even let you start for the University of Notre Dame. Yeah, but see, your servant, see, I used to be a shepherd. See, David understood something because he had the anointing of a king. When a king sees a giant, he doesn't see a problem. 
he sees a promotion. He knows that when he gets finished fighting the giant, that he's not going to be a shepherd anymore. Your servant used to be a shepherd. And I remember the time that a bear came. And I remember the time that a lion came. And the same God that did it then is the same God that's going to do it now. Can I tell you that when you stand on the battlefield of your life for that job interview or trying to cast the devil out of your family or you're trying to win that war over your addiction or you're trying to break that bondage over your depression or you're trying to loose the fetters of that sickness or that cancer has you terrified or your family's all busted up and you don't know how you're ever going to get them back together again. Can I tell you, you can stand on that same battlefield and say, I remember the time that a bear came and I remember the time that a lion came and the same same God that defeated Goliath a long time ago is the same God that's in my heart right now and I declare war on the kingdom of hell and I know my redeemer lives and I'm going to come out of this my babies are going to get saved this cancer is not going to defeat me my God is able he's exceeding abundantly above all I could ever ask or think my redeemer lives and I'll win this fight in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus hallelujah Hallelujah. Y'all come rescue me. I'm about to blow up up here. Listen. Thank you, Jesus. Dear God. Stand with me all over this house. All the Nephilims and the Amims and the Anakims and the, all, of the, all of the giants represented in Goliath. And that shepherd boy walks out there and says, no more after the day. And what's so cool is the giants that he couldn't defeat, he raised up people all around him, including, including his nephew, who had the ability to finish what he started. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. For today, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness in high places. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are mighty through God. For the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments, and bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I have been created for victory over monsters. That's why I'm here. All these monsters. You may say to their pastor, I don't believe in monsters. That's not true. You don't believe in monsters while you're in this sanctuary. But if you're swimming in Lake Lanier, and it's a little dark outside, and something brush up against your leg, you believe in Loch Ness Monster. Megalodon, you'll walk on water. We had Scott Crow down there by the boat dock. And uh, Jerry Josie used to love to pick on Scott Crow. And there was a, a black rope wrapped around and it was kind of laying there. And Scott looked over there. He said, what is that? Jerry said, that's a snake. Jerry didn't have time to even get his eyes open and looked up. Scott was already in the parking lot sitting in his car with the doors locked. <laughs> yeah, he locked the doors. That way Christy couldn't get in. She'd have to get, stay out there and deal with a snake. He locked the doors. <laughs> yeah. You ever seen that precious moments where that little boy got that shield up and it's all got band-aids on it and egg yolks on it and a little helmet on crooked and it says onward Christian soldier. You ever seen that Andy Griffith show where Opie Taylor gets in that fight with that bully? And there's that big kid coming out there to take his lunch money. And there's little Opie Taylor looking up at him. Mark Rutland tells a story about going to school and a bully had been picking on him. And Mark Rutland has an older brother. He doesn't talk about him much. I get the impression that. He's just one of those relatives you don't, you don't talk about a lot. I haven't got all of the story, but uh, he said he 
had an older brother that, that was really known for his, his fighting and his strength, his height. And uh, Mark Rutland wanted to deal with his bully, so he went to his brother. He said, can you help me deal with this, this bully? Won't you beat him up for me? He said, you started this fight, you finished it. I can't keep getting on, fighting all your fights for you. So he tells him, you stand there on them steps, you just tell him this, you tell him that. So Mark Rutland said he stood out there in front of that school and that bully sure enough started that picking at him and he said what he was supposed to say and braced for what he knew was coming. And that bully looked at him, he said, look, man, I, I don't want to start any fights with you. I appreciate your courage, man. We, we can be friends. Yeah, that's all right. Thank you. Not a problem. You just let that be a lesson, man. Me and you. And he turns around, and a brother standing right behind him <laughs> on that top step. You stare in hell in the face. And you start saying what you're supposed to say. And you're scared to death. And you don't know how it's going to turn out. And you don't know if anybody's going to believe in. You don't know what courage it's going to take to face the giants that enter in your life. I promise you that the enemy, when you resist him, will run away from you. And while he's running, you may think to yourself, I didn't know I had it in me. When you turn around, you're going to realize that you have an older brother. That's already defeated every devil that faces you in your life. There's no giant that's come against you that he hasn't already bound underneath the authority of his shed blood. Today I speak freedom and peace over you. Go out there and fight the giants. Face the monsters that are plaguing your thoughts and mind. Maybe I haven't described where they came from perfectly and I don't know everything I should know, but this I can tell you. We have power in the name of Jesus. Heavenly Father, I bless these good people tonight. I bless them with, with giant killing authority. I, I bless them tonight with the courage to face Goliath. I give them, Heavenly Father, the keys to the car of your power and authority. And I ask you, God, anoint them to be what you've called them to be. Let them move mountains. Storm the gates of hell with courage and faith. In Jesus' precious and mighty name, all God's people said aloud victorious. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you. I love you.